We especially welcome other people from Pennsylvania here, and we hope that this event assures you that Pennsylvania Dems are on the move, and hopefully it'll inspire you to join them too. Such involvement is the best thing that we each can do for our own mental health. We don't have to watch helplessly as Republican state legislatures reach new depths of voter suppression. Tonight, we want to raise $220,000 to support seven regional coordinators who will then help many local volunteers working in their own neighborhoods. Each dollar we give will not only be matched, but will multiply in effective action. For this fundraiser, Scott, Craigie and I have made one of our largest contributions ever um, because we really believe that this organizing work will be some of the best that we've seen. In recognition of that fact, all of the co-hosts have made their own donations before this event. We hope you will join us with your own generous support, but after you hear about the organizing plan, it's going to really be inspiring. So to start that off, we'll turn this back over to Lisa Herrick. Lisa, thanks so much. Thanks, Barbara. And thank you for that welcome. We can always count on you to be wonderful. So thanks very much. And thanks to all the co-hosts who agreed to do this and agreed to invite their guests, their friends, their families, their colleagues. Um, we just so appreciate it. I just wanna say a few words at the moment about why now? It's May, it's 2021. We're heading into the primaries of Virginia. Virginia has elections in November, 2021. So why the heck did we ask you to come here tonight in the spring of 2021 to talk about Pennsylvania? Why get going now? Why is it so important? You're gonna hear a lot tonight about why specifically Pennsylvania is so important. I'm sure most of you know that already, but you'll hear more detail. And you'll hear about what it is we are funding and why we're funding it. But I wanna just say a word about why we're doing it now. And what I would ask all of us to do is imagine a time in your life when you had an incredibly important project ahead of you with a goal that felt essential to you, perhaps passing the bar exam, perhaps preparing a room for your first baby before you'd ever had children, perhaps preparing to do your first surgery when you'd never done a surgery before, perhaps preparing to hike the entire Appalachian Trail, whatever it was, Everybody has had a project in their lives that was dear to their heart that felt incredibly important with a list of to-dos and a time frame to get it done. And I want to invite everybody to think back to that experience and remember what it felt like if you went to bed at night and you realized you did not have enough time. You did not have enough time to do all of the tasks. You did not have enough time to do your best and you did not have a, enough time to make success sure. And now think back to moments when you've gone to sleep at night thinking, I have left myself enough time. I'm doing every task with the most efficacy I could possibly bring to it. And if this project succeeds, it's going to succeed in the biggest way possible because I'm bringing my full self and I'm giving myself enough time. That is what we wanna do for Pennsylvania Democrats. They need a lot of time and they need to start now. January, 2022 is too late. Oops, I don't know where I went. Did somebody start screen sharing? Is that just on my screen? Jerry, you need to, you need to unshare the screen, Jerry Prusen. I don't know who that is, but okay. There you go. Thanks. A little for Zoom glitch, but that's okay. Anyway, we want to do it now because we want Democrats in Pennsylvania to have plenty of time for the project you're about to hear about. Because there's a lot to do. There's a lot of people to rely on. There's a lot of people to hire. And we want them to feel powerful with the wind at their backs 
when they roll into 2022. But I have three pieces of good news. One piece of good news is that there are enough voters in Pennsylvania who will vote Democrat for us to win Pennsylvania in 2022 if we just get them out. And this organization, this model that we're gonna tell you about is focused on doing just that, beginning the relationships with those voters now and carrying those relationships through to November, 2022, so that those are relationships, not strangers that are talking to strangers at the door. They're going to be relationships by the time we hit November, 2022. The second piece of good news is that this model has been tried in Wisconsin and it worked. It's worked repeatedly for a number of different elections, even in red districts. So we know the model works. It takes organization, it takes time, it takes people, but it works. The third piece of good news is that we need to raise a ton of money tonight and a ton of money in the weeks ahead. And the good news is 31st Street never fails to raise the money it says it's gonna raise. Mary Pence sets the goal. I take a big gulp and say, oh gosh, I don't know about that. And then our members, our co-hosts meet the goal every friggin' time. So here we are, it's 2021. Our eyes are on Virginia, but tonight they're on Pennsylvania in 2022 and beyond. So we're gonna meet our goal with your help and we're so grateful that you are here to help us. I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Shelton at this point to tell you more of the details about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, terrific, Lisa. Uh, Jim Shelton, retired epidemiologist and political analyst at 31st Street. Uh, I'm gonna share a screen because that's my best way of communicating and bring up a slide um, just to kind of warm up that indeed we welcome Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania welcomes us. Okay, so um, just to get into some of the specifics, again, many of you know this, but just to run through it, I think it's, it's my view, Pennsylvania is the most important state for 2020, a, a open US Senate seat. We're 50-50 now, as you know, everything teeters on the edge. Uh, we have a governor's race, the governor is democratic, um, but he keeps, and he keeps the uh, Republican legislature in check. Uh, if we lose that, we're in big trouble uh, in Pennsylvania, a hugely important state. We have some important house races. I'm gonna just talk about very briefly, half the state Senate, all the state house, uh, one Supreme Court uh, uh, seat, uh, other races too that I'm not even gonna go into. And we need to prepare for 2024. Again, this is the long-term process. But in the more short term is the point that actually um, Pennsylvania has many uh, key local races in 2021. Now those races are important in and of themselves, but they are also gonna give us the opportunity to get this um, organizing model running so it's able to be tested out and tried out and so forth and hopefully prove that it's gonna be working and that will give us momentum into 2022. Okay, just wanna mention there are these five uh, house races that are probably gonna be in contention. We are of course waiting on redistricting. Pennsylvania is gonna lose a seat that could put as many as four Democratic seats in jeopardy if they do it in a certain way. Uh, so we have to, to kind of uh, fight to, to keep them. And uh, also uh, there's always the 10th district that we would definitely love to turn blue. Okay, now I wanna talk about organizing. Now, I never really knew what organizing was to tell you the truth uh, until relatively recent, recently. But my view is it's really the name of the game for what you want to do in the longer term. And there's also a shorter term part of it, but basically um, it's uh, things like voter outreach in the longer term, doing it now, but especially deep canvassing, which reaches uh, uh, voters in a, in a more um, uh, successful kind of way, voter registration. I'm not gonna go through all these things, um, but they are components that are really important to be, have some lead time to do um, but here's the last one I've, I've uh, put in bold here, 
because another thing that's really important in organizing is working on local issues and local problems. And when you do that, you can earn um, the trust of the people that you're trying to work with. You know, it could be things like, uh, you know, lead in the water supply or people getting access to food or um, immunizations, um, but it's a really important part of uh, organizing. Now, of course, this model people may know was very successful in Georgia. That model is the grassroots model, but there's another model, which is the, um, uh, uh, the Democratic Party model, and they're both important. And uh, the, the Wisconsin model, of course, was the model where the Democratic Party approach has been tried out and been successful. There's also a more short-term, of course, thing, uh, a form of organizing and, and really um, called electioneering that uh, is what we're more used to in terms of what field organizers do. And that's all important too, but if you only do that, it's too late, in my opinion, to really have the best uh, impact by far. So that relates to the next thing, which I tend to call campaign timing dysfunction. You know, timing is everything. Uh, but we have this problem that um, the model that we actually use almost everywhere can be called the roller coaster model, which is that when there's a campaign or a set of campaigns, everybody gears up for the campaign and oftentimes very separately, not even all that well coordinated. Once the campaign, once the election's over, it fades away. Now think how dysfunctional that is to try to, <laughs> to, try to organize what you wanna do in terms of a party. Um, but what you really want is something more like an ocean liner or uh, something like that, different metaphor. You want something that really can move and move well and systematically. Okay, so now let's talk about this famous Wisconsin uh, neighborhood organizing model that Martha Lanning, who we're gonna hear from, was a, a sort of prime mover of. And um, basically the model is there's an organizing director for the state and there's a bunch, a bunch of what are called regional organizing directors. In our case, we're trying to get 12. And uh, the, no, this is very different from the model that you get with, with regular campaigns where they might just hire 100 organizers. We just want to hire these organizing directors. And then their approach is to find the people, the local volunteer leaders and contacts. Those people are out there whether they're in indivisible groups or precinct groups or whatever, they are out there. And um, there's a way to organize them so that they then are the leaders and they reach out to their contacts. So there's actually three major advantages to this. <laughs> One is it's cheaper because you're not paying these volunteers. They're like us, you know, they, 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 they really want to, uh, uh, do things and, and they don't need money. They need other kinds of rewards, uh, recognition and, and, and incentives and so forth like that. Uh, another major benefit though, is that they're, it's, it's constant. They're not going anywhere. I mean, may, sure some will come and go, and, but basically you're getting a continuous set of people that are working on it in a long-term um, basis. And then the last thing is that they live there. So they're not, people that have been brought in who then have to establish relationships in their communities, they live there. And so it's, it's a form of what's called relational organizing. And, um, you know, it's year round and it works. This is a little bit more zeroing in, uh, just to give you again, sort of spell it out a little more. This would be your regional organizing directors. And then these would be your leaders that you would find and the, uh, the job of the organizing directors is really the training, the recruitment, the support, the nourishing, the encouragement of uh, these uh, leaders and to some extent uh, their people. So it's a different kind of skill set to some extent, um, but it's, it's a, a, a very important one, obviously. So uh, I call this a game changer. I, I feel like doing this thing that I'm proposing to you now is the best opportunity I've seen of doing this in four years in terms of pound for pound of having impact. And here's why. It's, we have the opportunity to do something that's basically statewide. You know, it's not just one, one or a few, few candidates here and there. It's not just a few elections here and there. 
not to denigrate what we've done in the past, but it is potentially statewide at every le level, every election. Um, and it can build on the existing party structure, which is decent in Pennsylvania, in my opinion. Um, there's a technical point that um, the party can work directly with candidates and campaigns, whereas the grassroots groups, the C3s and the C4s uh, can't, at least for federal elections and often for state elections either. They have good access to data. They have the ability to hire high caliber staff. There's a prestige of working for uh, the Democratic Party. And I'm understand, I'm told that there are many good people that are folks they, that they can recruit, but they want to recruit them now. They need to do it uh, fast. And then uh, the idea is that th there will be, then when we shift into the campaign mode in 2022, we'll be hitting the ground running, if you will, and we can shift into that. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we're hoping that if we get this, this thing going, that it will catalyze a institutional change in the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania and how they do things. So here's probably the most important question in some ways that many people have and have asked me. Now, this seems so obvious. This seems so great. Why haven't the Democrats done this before? Well, one of the answers is just kind of inertia, kind of like they've never done it that way for the most part. Um, and there's limited money. Uh, many people that, you know, when I, the people that I've talked to about this, they would say, yeah, I'd like to do that, but we just really haven't had the money to do that. Well, why don't they have the money? The reason they don't have the money is because we have this sort of system that is so much focused on individual campaigns and collections of individual campaigns. And those in individual campaigns that we have charismatic, you know, candidates, we like to fall in love with them. We feel like we're helping when we give them money. That's all great. But most people don't even think about the party for doing this kind of thing. So, um, you know, this is my best, best explanation. But the fact is, it is the situation we're facing. And that's why it's a great opportunity. All right. So we have this wonderful partner, SPAN. As you can see at the bottom here, there's their logo, State Party Advancement Network. They're small. They're low profile, you'll hear from Martha. And like us, they don't actually even touch the money. I mean, we, we, we basically steer money from folks like you and ourselves through Act Blue to things. They do the same thing separately. They uh, steer money um, to uh, state parties, basically. And the advantages to us are, you know, not only will they give us a one for one match for whatever we raise, but we're getting a great set of uh, their modus operandi is that they require metrics and benchmarks from the party, which the parties agree to, and they'll be tracking that on our behalf. And we'll, we'll know what's going on too, because they'll let, everyone will let us know. But you know, that's something you don't get that with campaigns. Um, but also um, they have technical assistance uh, from this really great um, uh, organizing, uh, uh, regional organizing director guru uh, who provides great um, uh, experience technical assistance. So again, uh, I, I think it's just great for, it's a great fit for us. Uh, well, and the other, and one other thing is that to the extent it works and hopefully it will, we'll have the ability to cross fertilize so that other states might also pick up on this concept. Okay, so our goal tonight, why we're here, we're here to raise money, of course, for this great thing I'm talking about. So we wanna hire 12 regional organizing directors. Very concrete, that's exactly what we wanna do. <laughs> now, our portion of that is gonna be $350,000. Tonight, we're trying to just to raise funding for seven of those people, um, just because we thought that might be uh, attainable uh, with this one sort of funding initiative and our portion of that is going to be two hundred twenty thousand dollars, and that's why uh, that's what the that's what the goal is. And uh, we'll show you something related to that. So some of our folks thought it'd be nice to have a, a, a kind of a pictogram or something like that, so you would know as we go through this how much of this we have funded. And we have now, as of when we started this meeting, we had raised sixty-seven thousand dollars, 
And if you look at the green people here, you can see that we've done a little more than two people as of then, maybe we don't, hopefully we've done more. So uh, again, we realize people like to have, see a little bit of, of something concrete when they donate money. So this is very, very specific and concrete. So that basically done is done with what um, I've got to say. Um, I think uh, I'll then just turn it over to Martha Landing. It, it, our, our custom is I don't spend a lot of time giving her bio and that sort of thing. She's great at introducing herself, but just to say that, you know, she's done a terrific thing in Wisconsin and in doing it in many other states. Over to you, Martha. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to pull up my screen here and be sure. Can you, can everybody see my screen um, with the Wisconsin? Oops. Now I don't know if you can. Did I lose you? We can see. No. Can you see my screen that shows the Wisconsin logo? We can see mountains. Okay, that is not what you're supposed to be seeing. So we're going to try again. I apologize. I live in rural Wisconsin and my computer uh, is challenging. The Wisconsin map was there at first and then it quickly. And then it disappeared. It disappeared for me too. So I don't know why that happened. So, um, I'm gonna try it again here. We're just gonna do it this way. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. Oh, fabulous, okay. So um, I'm Martha Lanning and I was, uh, I wanna kind of take a step back and just share with you how I got started in all of this. So I'm actually from business and community development, but Scott Walker was destroying Wisconsin as you all know. And so I was inspired to run for state Senate back in 2014 and I, was told that I just needed to close a two point spread. I did 7% better than the top of the ticket. So you'd think that I'd be Senator Lanning, but I learned the next day that I'd lost by 20%. It was a huge shock uh, to me. And I started pulling on my uh, business experience, getting stats and things and learned how important a strong democratic party is. Because what happened to me was that I learned that while I was focused on getting those independents or getting the, the people right there in the middle to vote for me, we didn't have a statewide program or even a program in my community that was going to get the Democrats to turn out. And this is a little graph and I apologize that both lines are red, that just happened to me today. The top line is Democratic turnout. And these two peaks here are when Barack Obama ran in our state and won by such huge margins. But the lower points here are what was happening in our midterm elections that we kept losing in our midterm elections. And it was because Democrats just weren't turning out. We had this huge volatility. So what I did is I traveled around the state of Wisconsin after my run and was talking to a lot of people about what is going on in our state. We were gonna hire or elect a new state chair. And what do we need the state party to do? And in the process of doing that, I was asked to run for chair. I did. And I'm really consolidating a lot of work into a short little presentation here. But what we learned was that we Democrats needed to learn how to do a lot more work for a lot less money. And I was looking at President Obama's model in Wisconsin and saying, how did he turn out, if I went back here, how did he get so many more voters to turn out? What was his race? Why was it different from Kerry and Gore who had won by five and 11,000 votes while he won by 400,000 and 200,000 votes? And later Hillary Clinton lost by 20 some thousand votes. So the big difference was the field program. And so we knew that we needed to activate our volunteers, the greatest resource we had. We also identified that we wanted to be a resource for candidates. So the candidates weren't hiring consultants, often from out of state, that really don't know our state and making bad decisions for them. And finally, a lot what James just talked about is, why do we just shut everything down and recreate the wheel every cycle? We needed to change how the Democratic Party worked. So I will tell you that there was some resistance and James had referred to this. I had raised a lot of money to run for state Senate. I didn't have troubles raising money. I went to some of those same people to ask them to help me build a stronger state party. And a lot of them looked at me and said, well, Martha, why doesn't the state party already do this? Like, this is crazy. 
And a big part of it was a lack of resources. When I came in, we only had six staff members for the entire state on and one comms person, you know, an executive director, one political person. Here we are supposed to do all of this work. We had nobody, not a single person that worked with activists or organizing because there weren't resources. Um, the DNC gives you right now, they give $150,000 a year guaranteed to a state party, but anything beyond that you have to raise. I also heard from investors though, that the party's like a big black hole. Like I give you money and I never find out what happens. And that's something we as state parties needed to change. And I did, I ended up having a briefing that occurred regularly with our donors so that donors would hear how we were doing and they were part of our team. And then finally I heard, it's not the, the top of the tickets job was an issue. People were telling me that's the top of the tickets job, the presidential or the gubernatorial, or the US Senate candidate. We simply can't sit around and wait for the candidate to be identified and then wait for them to build this program. It wasn't working in Wisconsin. So what we did is we did a lot of things, but this is the, the most important one is we went back and launched Obama's neighbor to neighbor program. So we wanted to build teams all over the state of Wisconsin that were trained to independently organize about whatever issue they wanted. We had some that were organizing picketing Paul Ryan's office. We had some that were pick, that were organizing about water quality or sand fracking or building a new school. Whatever they wanted to organize, we took our staff, our organizing team, we had hired five regionals, we had a constituency outreach and a youth director, and then a state organizing director that supervised all of them. We worked with them to just build teams and to have the staff teach people how to target, how to organize, how you're going to do follow-up calls to be sure people show up for your activities. It was a huge success. We, we built 99 teams. The first graph on the left is 99 teams in 2017, but by the election in 2018, we had over 200 active teams around the state. And you can see they're all over the state, um, which was really encouraging to us because a lot of times people don't spend any time in those rural areas. The results were phenomenal with half of the money that we spent in 2016 on Hillary Clinton's field program, we did 80% more doors than we had done in 16. So it was a huge hit, but it isn't just important that you do doors because if people don't turn out to vote, what, what difference did it make? We went in and looked at our universe of 752,000 voters and we found that 75% of them had voted and that's two and a half percent higher than our statewide average for voting. And considering that we were targeting voters that were less likely to show up, that were infrequent voters in midterms, it was a huge win for us. I have some other stats on here, but one of my favorite ones is because we were using this organizing team model and we weren't hiring staff, we could have them all over the state and in areas where we weren't, we didn't have a lot of activity happening. The 19 reddest counties in all of Wisconsin gave Governor Evers his win margin. They increased Democratic votes by enough to give him his win margin. Now, all but one of those were counties we would have never put staff in. And had we not built these organizing teams and supplied them with this valuable information, we wouldn't have won. And so um, it was just a huge hit. When I left being state party chair, you know, I, had, I handed off to Ben Wickler, who's done a phenomenal job, but I wanted to go out and start taking our program and be sure that other states could have it. And so we launched the state party advancement network in December of 2019, just after I had left. And we allow, we just asked the state parties if they um, had a proposal about something that they wanted to do. We worked with nine states last year. They have to commit to best practices. They have to commit that they're gonna give us metrics on what they're trying to accomplish, that they're gonna monitor it, that they're gonna get back to us on how they're doing, and that they're going to um, be very honest about the information and the, that they're supplying us. We uh, would review their proposals and then we'd recommend to donors. We ended up raising $5.5 million for the nine states. And I have all kinds of stories about the things that we did that and how it made a big impact in Georgia and Arizona and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan. It was just really valuable. So we're doing that again this year. And with your team, um, we're excited to be helping because when you're raising that $350,000, I'm going to be raising with other donors a matching goal. Now, uh, Jason Henry in Pennsylvania, 
you are lucky enough to be working with one of the great um, directors we have. Oftentimes executive directors don't stick around. The average is 18 months. So the fact that Jason was the interim director um, in 2020 and has the whole experience of the 2020 election and was the political director before that, so has even more experience with the state party and is carrying it into this year is a huge win for us. On top of that, I've really enjoyed working with Jason because he identifies what a problem would be that, hey, we're gonna have candidates taking our regional directors away because they need help for things and we're not gonna be focused. So we should start a whole different group of organizers and rods that would be totally focused to grassroots organizing. I love that. He's honest about what's going on and I know he's the right guy for Pennsylvania. So I'm gonna introduce him now and stop sharing here. Um, so that Jason can share you a little bit about himself and uh, the program that he hopes to run with your support. Jason. Thank you, Martha. I really appreciate uh, that intro. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, like, listen, you've been a wonderful ally. Um, your insight has been helpful. And, you know, for those people that don't know how hard it is to run a state party, um, you're always, you're always blamed for everything that goes wrong. Um, you're never given credit for anything that you do. Um, but having somebody like Martha that understands the significance of kind of the, that organizing model that I learned as an organizer back on, on then Senator Obama's campaign back in 2008 is huge. Um, so Martha, thank you for your help with it, um, for this. Um, Lisa, Jim, thank you for, for, um, be let, letting us kind of be letting me be a part of it and kind of talk about you know Pennsylvania and what we're trying to do and where we're at and and kind of like what we want to accomplish this year. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Please bear with me um, as I do that. Okay. Oops, hold on one second. Sorry. Um, I present. Oh, sorry. You bear with me. Um, share screen. That's what I want. Share. Okay. Can everybody see what um, my my screen? Yes. Cool. All right. So um, Pennsylvania is is it's 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 we are a heavily populated state. We're now we we are now the fifth largest state in the country, um, but we're also arguably one of the most complicated states in the country. Um, we have over 30,000 elected officials that we have to deal with. Um, in my home county alone here in Allegheny County, um, <clears throat> we have just Democratic elected officials. We have 917 Democratic elected officials um, who are always kind of, they have their own thing going on in their own pet projects. So we have a very large, complicated, diverse state um, that we have a lot of interest to balance. So trying to run an organization and trying to put together a plan that kind of keeps our political allies and elected officials, you know, keep them going and helping us, but also understand that we have a job to do, which is to turn out voters um, for, for elections is a big deal. So one thing I wanted to kind of talk about is where we've been and where we've and how we've gotten to this point. The past four, the past four years have been huge for this state. And I know that Martha and, and Jim both talked about accountability. We have been accountable in this state. In 2018, we had a very difficult race at the with the um, with reelecting our governor, reelecting our Senator Casey. Um, we also elected, um, we went from having five, five members, uh, Democratic elect, uh, members of Congress to nine members in Congress. Um, we won a breakthrough election with Connor Lamb in arguably one of the hardest elections in the country. Um, I think a lot of you were either part of that or remembered that. Those are big wins and they were also all grassroots driven. That's gonna be a, a point I'm gonna drive home time after time again. In 2019, um, where we had kind of, we were going on the down slope is on the roller coasters Jim talked about, we pared down, but we still made strategic in, in investments in Delaware County, which is outside of Philadelphia, for those who don't know. We won that county, took control of that county for the first time since the Civil War, right? That's a huge deal. The, those suburban Philadelphia counties, while they've been trending Democrat, you know, over the past couple of years, that is not, that's not, his, that's not historical. They are historically Republican areas that we have spent time putting grassroots effort on the ground to win those races. And then obviously last year, you know, the big thing was, you know, obviously electing, winning the state and flipping it for Joe Biden, but this state, Put in an F, put in a vote by mail program that has never been done before and, and had not been done before um, 
in, in Pennsylvania history. And I think states that have vote by mail, they kind of do a gradual ramp up. We did this, we rammed this thing through in six months. So we had to educate millions and millions of voters how to vote by, how to, just how to do it. Um, and, a, and a lot of that effort was done by, again, phone banking, texting, um, and it was done by messaging that we as a state party led on to help get that out there. And ultimately those votes are what carried the president um, and, and the vice president to victory. Um, so just in 2020 alone, and this goes back to the peak of what we did, and in, in, in this is all grassroots. We had a massive staff, one of the biggest in the country. But the numbers we did to contact, I know a lot of you were a part of that, over total between the primary and the, the pre-convention and post-convention, our team, our organizers, this party, and the volunteers did over 90, almost 94 million voter contact attempts. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the most that was in the country. Um, and if you look here, because of that work that was done on the ground, we improved our presidential margin from Hillary Clinton to Joe Biden by 14.6% overall. And, and we improved it in 41 of 67 counties. And with such a narrow margin, um, that was a huge reason that we were able to win. Um, voter protection. We had the biggest, biggest voter protection program in the country. We had 73,000, you know, you can see the stats there. Um, you know, we were doing handling 12,000 calls a day the last six weeks of the race. The number one issue was vote by mail, but this program, these stats was because we invested in having an actual almost grassroots organized, organized based what we call county councils, but they're essentially neighborhood teams that we took, we take that method and apply it to a voter protection model. So we have, you know, a group of neighborhood team attorneys that can go out and handle things across, you know, in whatever county that it may be. Um, you know, this voter protection program with all the lawsuits and all the drama with, you know, voter suppression attempts and everything, this was a huge deal. Um, we spent a lot of money in this state last year. I think like just on the voter protection, the field program, all that stuff, we spent $23 million. Um, we don't have a lot of money left um, because it was such a boom and bust cycle. We had to, we had to, we went for broke and we, and you saw the results that we had, but that didn't, we was kind of like, we got, it's, it's almost like the dog caught the, caught its tail. And now it's like, what do we do next? Right. But in Pennsylvania, we have elections, you know, every couple months. You can see with some of the stuff we've done digitally, we can see some of the stuff we've done with, with mail. Um, you can see on the comms front, we were always doing press events and helping, the, and helping push out the narrative. Um, this party, this organization has put in a lot of effort to really build, to, to build that 2020 program took a lot of help from a lot of different people, including a lot of you on the call. But now we're moving on to 2021 and we're moving on to 2022. Um, so we have a very hard road against us, uh, up against us. Um, and I, you know, knowing that state parties kind of are like this unheralded kind of way that we can organize, um, what we do this year and next year is going to impact what happens in 2024. And quite frankly, what's going to happen in 2028 when knock on whatever my desk is made out of, um, we'll be trying to hold uh, the White House for a third term. Um, so understanding the significance of investing in a state party like Pennsylvania, like Wisconsin, um, like Michigan, um, we're ground zero. At the end of the day, elections are not won and lost in rooms in Washington, D.C. They're won in the states. Um, and, and your help by pushing that into helping that build us program is a, is a key thing. Um, so kind of what we learned from last year and why we need this is so important is digital working is a big is a big thing that we must have and not just during the pandemic. We've already hired, we've already increased our digital organizing. And these are investments that we made already and why we need help, all of your help kind of getting us over the top on this thing. We've invested in digital organizing. Door-to-door um, -door still matters. We did door-to-door. -door. Florida did not do door-to-door. -door. And I think that's a big reason why we were able to win and Joe Biden was winning Pennsylvania and we didn't win Florida. But understand that door-to-door -door matters and improving data with the help of, of, of Stack, one of Martha's um, 
you know, help organize that. We're really trying to up our data game and having cleaner data, better data. That's a big deal if you're trying to build a program. We're engaging communities of color. We've hired a constituency director um, in for the Latin, the Latin American community, African American community, rural community um, to build that program. We're in making early investments in voter protection. We've got those funds to reboot, reboot our voter protection team earlier than we did in 2019. Um, and then most importantly, campaigns win with ground games. When it's a fight, when it's a two point win, we need that fight and we need that ground game. And what our plan is, because we have some key races like Jim talked about, we wanna have for the first time in Pennsylvania Democratic Party history, an actual field program that is a permanent thing that would then take the momentum we had from 2020, turn it into 2021, and then go into 2022 and just kind of keep that kind of infrastructure as a baseline, um, not having to kind of rebuild the whole thing from scratch like a lot of campaigns, you know, a lot of states have had to do in the past. We already talked about kind of the, 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 the appellate court races that's up this year. And then for those of you who were from Pennsylvania or paid attention to it, those Supreme Court races were another huge reason, our Supreme Court victories back in 2015 were a big reason we were able to protect vote by mail when Trump went after it. So us having these races this year and fighting for the Supreme, for our courts, our appellate courts is a big, big, big deal. Um, so we have to make sure that we can support those candidates because people don't know about judges. They don't like, they don't think about that. So telling them, making sure that the Democrats and voters understand that they share those values and using this as the way to kind of lay that foundation to have a permanent structure moving forward is, is, kind, is, very, is very key. And also these local races are also important. Jim, Jim knows I say this all the time. Erie County, Pennsylvania is a massive deal. It is the swing county of all swing counties. It is the battleground of all battlegrounds. Um, and on top of that, this past week, this past week was our primary. Um, Erie is poised to make actually make history by electing, if our candidate wins, um, his name is Tyler Titus. He will be the first transgender um, executive elected official in the American history. So it's a big deal and he's running against a crazy MAGA extremist. Um, so like we have the, we have, we not only can we make history, but having that county executive when we have, when we're having to have issues with trying to open up drop boxes and trying to open up, keep hours open a little bit later to accept vote by mail, that's a huge, huge deal. And as you can see on the screen, both of these counties were determined by under 2,500 votes in last year. So like, Erie in Northampton in their, their, their swing districts, we need to have, be able to help those candidates with the ground game so they can focus on putting mailers, doing digital, doing TV ads. We need to be there to help do the organizing, to help push them over the top and then build that um, kind of ground game um, that will last going forward. Um, and then like we talked about 2022, I can skip over that. Um, we're, also, we're also doing a big voter registration push that we wanna enfold into this program. We wanna register 200, 125,000 Pennsylvania voters because now the margin between us and the Republicans is now down to 650,000. We've already done stuff with, we've already sent direct mail. We've already worked with Civic Tech to identify 300,000 unregistered likely Democrats in, in Pennsylvania. We've made these investments already, but we don't have quite enough to do this, to do the other stuff, and then also do the key part that we're seeing that we're missing, which is having that full-fledged ground program that is on the ground helping, helping build a, a, um, a, a true, well-rounded state party. Our digital director is building a brand new um, voter registration thing on, on your phone That's the, because our Department of States is not it's just kind of clunky. So this actually helps make things easier so that if you, I did this with a friend last night, he wasn't registered to vote. I did it on, I did it right on my phone, but I had to go through the Department of States and it took me 25 minutes to get the thing to work. This will take cut things down in, in five to 10 minutes. Um, so, so this is an, another investment that we're making to in the ramp up to 2022 and beyond. But again, there's a big key piece of that missing, which is the on the ground part organizing. Um, we want to make sure that when with this with this on the ground thing is we're we're partnering with faith leaders, civic leaders, um, 
making sure that we can start doing door knocking. It is safe again to do that. Organizing the college campuses once they go back in the fall, organizing with the college Democrats. We need bodies to do that because it's a big state. Um, it, you know, I, I have to drive to Philadelphia. I'm dreading my drive to Philadelphia from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia tonight because I'm going to get there like two in the morning. But that's what we need to do to build this thing up and actually have a real full-fledged campaign um, and a full-fledged structure that can sustain itself year after year after year. Um, um, you know, this is this more stuff about how we kind of like our plan to uplift and, and do this year round. Um, also, we want to open more field offices. We want to hire these organizers like we're talking about again and then do it in more places than we were able to do in 2017 and the 2017-2018 cycle. Um, we're also doing things like uh, um, making sure that we're doing Spanish language stuff. That's something that we didn't do. And again, an investment we're making. Um, you know, so a lot of these things that we are doing with the kind of building out this program, it's we still need to have the ground game to push our to, to do the infrastructure to build those lasting relationships. And again, Lisa, Jim, Martha, everybody on this call, you know, thank you for even considering this project. Um, it's it will pay dividends. I believe in field. I came up through field um, and and. I think that if we can do this and do this right, this is a model that we can take to other states, Ohio. We can take it to states like Georgia. We can take it to the Carolinas. We can grow this and, and improve that if you invest in field and you invest in people, that ultimately can trump anything else that you know our, our opponents can throw at us. Thank you so much, Martha and Jason. That was wonderful. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go to Mary Pence, who's going to do a quick note. Then we're going to go to Rob to be our final co-host. And then we're going to open it for Q&A for all who would like to stay on with questions. And we will stick around and ask Martha and Jason to stick around to do any questions that come at us. So at this point, I think we're gonna to go to Mary. Um, see, I need to enter a new card. It did you're, on, you're on mute, Mayor. Okay. Yep. I think I just unmuted myself. Hello, my name is Mary Shelton Pence. I am one of the ordinary people who was radicalized by the November 2016 election. Since then, we've had some good outcomes, but knowing how slim is the margin by which Democrats hold the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, I am still highly motivated to do something every week to prepare for our next challenges in 2022 and 2024. So I have a question that I want to ask you very directly, and it is this. What is the most significant and impactful way you can spend your money right now on May 26, 2021, about four months after the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and after gaining the majority in the US Senate. I can tell you how my husband, Dan, and I have answered this question. We are both retired, but we have contributed $7,500 to this event and to the hope of putting Pennsylvania firmly in the blue column. I tell you that not to guilt trip you or to suggest to you what you should do, but rather to let you know that I'm not asking you to do something that I haven't already done myself. A few days ago, I heard James Carville being interviewed. And one of the things that he said echoed something I've thought about for a long time, but not quite in the way that he expressed it. As you know, Carville helped Bill Clinton get elected in 1992, and he'd been in politics for a long time before that. 
Here's what he said. He said, you know, I've been involved in, in fights over policies and between political parties for decades. What is new now is that we are fighting to save our democracy itself. And that is exactly what is at stake as we raise money tonight for the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. Would you please join Dan and me and Lisa and Jim and Barbara and Scott and all of our co-hosts in stretching whatever that is for you to contribute what you can right now. And I thank you so much. And now I would like to introduce Rob Clayman. Rob Clayman is the member of the 31st Street Leadership who got us to commit to Wisconsin, Martha, in early 2020. Rob? My name is Rob Clayman. I'm here with my wife, Carol Miller. Uh, before making our contribution, we thought about where we've been over the past four years and whether we can change the playbook to make a real difference. You may also be considering all that we've been through since 2016. It's been a constant battle to gain and hold ground where absolute truths compete against ridiculous lies. Last year was for most people a bad dream, uh, a, a merciless pandemic, existential elections, and an endless assault on our democracy. Where are we now? We are probably, like many of you, working hard to muster the energy or interest to get back on track, to subject ourselves to another cycle of politicking. But we see hope. One way is to create a new approach, one that gets us off the roller coaster and onto an ocean liner moving steadily forward. This fundraiser for Pennsylvania provides a solution. So what can we do? As Thomas Paine said, offer nothing more than simple facts, plain arguments, and common sense. What we have learned over the past four years is that the noisemakers too often drown out simple facts with baseless claims, counter plain arguments with unfounded conspiracies, and defeat common sense with appeals to fear and anger. How do we seize control of the conversation? By building a new democracy's infrastructure, the most build, basic building block of which is trust, including trust in our neighbors. And that is what the Wisconsin Democratic Party used to construct its neighbor to neighbor program. Its bedrock principle is simple. When you speak to a friend or member of the same community, you are far more likely to trust the information they provide than if it were offered by an outsider or one of the noisemakers. Neighbor to neighbor volunteers talk to people who live next door, down the street, or are in the same apartment building or social network. And those conversations continue without regard to any election. They take place in every season, year in and year out. And so the trust building does not come and go. It is perpetual. Pennsylvania Democrats see the Wisconsin experience as the blueprint for seizing the conversation. Now it needs the funds to make that happen, to adopt those best practices. It starts with the hiring of seven regional organizers and growing that number to 12 that we will recruit volunteers throughout Pennsylvania to create neighborhood teams. We need to come together now to make it happen. Let's provide Pennsylvania with the organizers that can begin to lay those building blocks of trust that are so vital to democracy's infrastructure. 
trust that will let neighbors speak and heed simple truths, plain arguments, and common sense. Thank you for joining us tonight and a special thank you to all of our fellow co-hosts and their friends. This ends our program, but if any of you want to stay on for additional discussion, the presenters will stay as well. Thank you so much, Rob. And thanks to everyone for sticking around. We really appreciate it. There's a lot of donating going on. Um, Jim just put in the chat that he thinks ActBlue has a bit of a lag, but we're at about 120,000, which is fantastic for one night, for one hour. <laughs> it's kind of amazing, um, but we'll keep going strong. So um, we're opening it now to questions. The formal part of our program is over, but Martha's sticking around, Jason's here, Jim is here. Um, so please either put questions in the chat and Aaron will curate those, or um, if he's not getting to you, you can just raise your hand and wave and we'll, we'll find you. Great. Uh, I have a couple questions already that I've been collecting and curating. Uh, so uh, Martha or Jason or whoever wants to take this one, maybe Jim, uh, the first question is, the GOP has out-organized the Dems for years, including in 2020. What have we learned from them and their successes? Why are they so much better? So I'm gonna jump in on this one and say, this is gonna give you a little bit of hope, right? Because we're all horrified by how close that election was. It certainly shouldn't have been that close, it's crazy. But the big issue here was the Biden team was telling all the state parties don't do doors because if they were sending people out to do doors and telling people to social distance, it's a contradiction and the Republicans could have used it against them in advertising that they say one thing, but they do another. There are some states that took it upon themselves to do doors um, on their own, like as a state party saying it wasn't part of the Biden team. But where we did not do doors, we really got clobbered. Florida, no doors, we're done. We got clobbered. Texas, we got clobbered. So the, the Republicans went into these communities. And if there's anything that came out of this is doors matter. Having that personal contact of someone coming and sharing with you what they were gonna do really made an impact. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that um, the, the exchange of data, we implemented DDX this last cycle. It made a huge impact helping both soft side and hard side. And so that that was a really good program. And the third thing is the Republicans do have year round infrastructure. They do it with Americans for Prosperity and other groups that are organizing in communities and showing up at the picnics, at the churches and talking about why this is important and why these people are not who you want to represent them. That's what these organizing programs can do, but through our volunteers, where we'll actually have people sharing that if you elect Democrats, you're going to have a better life. Here's the opportunities that you and your family will have because of Democrats being in office. So I think we are learning from them, but I also would say that this year was really tough for us to manage because of, the, of COVID uh, and the contradiction we would have had. Great. Thank you so much. And I love hearing the Midwestern accent. I'm originally from Michigan and I'm currently in Michigan visiting my mother for the first time in a year and a half. So uh, just love hearing that. Um, and we could use some of your help in Michigan too, by the way. Uh, and I'm glad to see Span is active there. Um, another question that came through is, it seems like President Obama was the seed for this approach. What kind of input and or inspiration is he currently having? So we're putting together the SPAN materials that we're going to be sharing with all states, because again, why is everybody having to recreate their own program? We're pulling it together. And his videos, it's still, I'm like, I haven't seen some of them for a while. And I'm, re, I'm like, they are so inspirational. We're using a lot of his videos. He's a great storyteller. So he can really tell people about how do you connect about your story with your neighbors and your families. Um, and he is a strong supporter of just organizing. He always has been. Um, we have reached out to him. I've actually sent to his office to say, I'm just letting you know that we're doing this and we're reusing all of your material. I haven't yet heard back, but I think he's probably busy with other things. Um, but he, he is an inspiration and he's somebody that we really have to leverage. His program worked and uh, we're putting it out there. It sure would be great if we hear from him. And I'll let you know if we do. Awesome. That'd be great. Um, are there 31st swing left uh, type groups helping span with fundraising in other states? 
you are the first, um, but I have to tell you, this is kind of breaking my mold right now. I was going, uh, I have a really good friend, uh, Lou Friedland. He's a professor at UW-Madison and he was doing amazing work and telling me about it all. And I always said, we should join together because I would be able to reach out to some of the large dollar donors that we were um, reaching out to and then getting the grassroots. But I think this model is phenomenal. And I also will tell you that uh, I love talking to all donors, but this has been so energizing to see so many people involved. Um, so we would love to see this grow in other groups. So you just send any of those uh, swing left groups that would like to join, we'd love to hear from them. Awesome. See, 31st Street always leading the way and the cutting edge, I, I love it. And we actually, Lou came and spoke to our group uh, last year. So uh, that's great. Um, you, you, were, a, you were asking about other states too, though, right? Um, so, yeah. so other states, I mean, you mean we other states? Done, are if we can raise states. the money. We have interest in other states as well. Oh. Um, yeah. But I, I know that actually uh, Martha will say that North Carolina is actually pretty well doing it on its own. Go ahead, Martha. Yeah, so Pennsylvania, well, North Carolina has a program, a similar proposal like Pennsylvania does, but I've already secured a $250,000 donation for them. You guys are the first donation in Pennsylvania. So it's like, this has been a really good, I was working on that one, we're working on this one, and then we can match. So um, I really appreciate that. We're, we are in nine states right now, and we are considering adding uh, additional states this year. These were the nine that we were in before, which are Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Arizona, Texas, and I think that's nine. Um, so we're really excited to work with all of them and we appreciate your work here in Pennsylvania. And once you're done with that, we would love your help in North Carolina too. Great. Um, I have a question for Jason and actually it's a kind of an amalgamation of a trend of questions I'm seeing in the chat, which is, uh, there's so much hate being encouraged on the right. How do we counter this? Democrats have been battered by GOP messaging around defund the police and socialism. What are PA Dems doing to create messaging to combat these tropes about Democrats are, you know, defunding the police and, and socialists? Yeah, so what, what the approach we have, one, we've, ex we've expanded our communications team to be able to kind of, one, highlight the stuff that the Biden administration is doing, particularly for, say, like rural areas, where that's where you hear that the most um, about, you know, why are we saying defund the police? Um, two, when we do these press events, we make sure that we're always finding a local elected Democrat, whether it's a mayor, a township supervisor, a school board member, to lift up those voices so they can make sure that like they're not being when they think of a democrat the, the the person they're thinking of is the the mayor who lives three four three doors down who's also a teacher a high school principal right they're not thinking of nancy pelosi or chuck schumer right um that's number one number two um one of the things that we're doing is helping our candidates particularly again in these more rural areas um give them communications training um helping them make sure that they stay on message and making sure that like if you get hit with like a quote unquote defund the police message like how do you successfully refocus the the argument to talk about what like that's not a that's not a thing that in, is impacts a lot of communities in in, in rural pennsylvania um but broad, the lack of broadband does, lack of infrastructure does, and making sure that they're refocusing the, the talking or what we're talking about on those bread and butter issues that actually do impact um, Pennsylvanians across, you know, across, the, uh, across the Commonwealth. Great. Okay, um, any other questions as we start to move toward the end here? Do you wanna see the figure? If people want to see the stick figures? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Stick figures, please. All right. Okay. So, yeah. Look at that. So, yeah, basically we have enough funds now for four of these people. So in a way we're a third of the way there or over half of the way there. So, and of course, hopefully, uh, uh, lovely people will continue to, to donate, especially over the next day or so. It'll move us a lot closer to our goal. Over. Great. Thank you. I had one question in the chat from someone who asked if there was any way to get a copy of this recording of, of tonight. Um, we uh, will edit this down and put it on the 31st Street 
YouTube, YouTube channel, which you can find by going to 31ststreet.org. Um, that'll take us a few days, but um, the main chunks of the program will be on our YouTube channel. So if you want to see it or share it with anybody, you can send them to that. Um, thank you all so much for coming on a Wednesday night or wherever you are, Wednesday afternoon. Um, we so appreciate it. And Martha and Jason, thank you so much for your efforts, for your work, for um, everything you're doing. And thank you for coming to us and telling us about how you're gonna win Pennsylvania for our country.